Thank you, Mario. Thank you, uh, Professor Hubner, for this very uh, stimulating uh, keynote address. Uh, warm welcome also from, from my side. I am, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm here the Deputy Director uh, at VEV, and I have the, the honor to, uh, to moderate this panel uh, this morning, the final part of the morning session, with this very broad topic, I would say, European integration in light of geopolitical uh, challenges. Uh, we have now, I think, about an hour. We have a hard stop at 10 to 1, so we have quite a tight schedule, uh, a lot of topics uh, to cover. Uh, so I don't want to say uh, too much uh, at the start. I would just briefly introduce our panelists. We already, Professor Hubner was already uh, introduced. We also have, I'm very happy to say, uh, Birgit Niesner, the Director of Economic Analysis and Research Department here at the ÖNB. Uh, she will be speaking, I should emphasize, in personal capacity today. Uh, and I can report from personal experience, Birgit is really a, a, an expert, as we know, from years of, of exchange uh, on, on Central and Eastern Europe. We also have, I'm very happy to say, uh, Valina Chakarova here next to me, uh, the director at the Austrian Institute for European and uh, Security Policy, someone I can say that we at VEV turn to very regularly to help us understand uh, geopolitics, and uh, we are doing that uh, again today. And we have Guntram Wolf, the director of Bruegel, uh, soon to be director of DIGAP, I think. Uh, I'm, not, yeah, yeah, I'm not revealing any secrets there. Um, who uh, has been director of Bruegel for almost a decade. And as Michael Landesman was saying in his introduction yesterday, uh, really Bruegel has been in this momentous decade, I would say, for European uh, economic policy, a very helpful and useful uh, guide for us. So. To start, what I would like to do is to turn to each of our other panelists in turn and ask them to respond to uh, the keynote address, and then we will come to the audience uh, for questions. I am sure to, to leave space uh, for the audience. So I'll start with you, Valina, uh, on the geopolitics. Um, thinking about uh, what Professor Hubner said as well, I mean, how do we understand this geopolitical moment? I mean, everybody has made clear we live in a momentous time. This is a Titan event, it's a time of change. Is it a new Cold War? Is that a useful way to understand it, or, 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 is, or is there a better way to think about it? Yes, um, from my personal point of view, uh, it is a Cold War 2.0 uh, moment, and uh, the choice by the Russian president uh, to uh, launch a full-scale war against Ukraine on February 24th uh, this year uh, has been and has to be put in this uh, geopolitical context. Uh, the, the first important, uh, of course, um, layer of this decision was uh, linked to Ukraine. So Ukraine's subjugation was uh, the ultimate goal right from the beginning. And we should be aware of the fact that uh, this goal, uh, political, economic, uh, civil, civilizational, if you like, uh, subjugation will um, not be away from uh, Putin's agenda, no matter what kind of peace talks uh, will uh, be launched, uh, hopefully, in the near future. Uh, of course, the second important layer was um, of this war was um, linked to the European Union and to the European powers because um, on the 24th of uh, February, I argued that uh, the president also uh, launched a war against us, a commodities, economic uh, war. Uh, that, mean, that means, of course, that the one idea was to uh, basically prevent further uh, accession of um, Eastern European uh, countries into the common market, uh, peaceful geoeconomic uh, expansion of the European Union project, but also to render the e European Union as a bloc and the European powers as uh, geopolitically irrelevant, to show the world that we are not able to prevent a war from happening. And then, of course, what thankfully he miscalculated was uh, um, the, the scope and the coherence of the European Union approach. Uh, and finally, it was also um, a war that we need to consider in the context of um, what uh, Madame Hübner outlined in her speech, uh, which is also um, a very much relevant um, for the long game. Uh, that would be, of course, the systemic competition between the United States and China, where uh, the Russian president seeks to position Russia, uh, basically to upgrade Russia's 
positioning in this uh, upcoming systemic competition by closing the chapter on Ukraine, by, closing, by sealing office in uh, Europe, by creating a bigger geopolitical bloc with uh, Belarus, with parts of Ukraine. I'm finishing. I know that we are uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, we have quite a tight uh, agenda, but basically by having a bigger geopolitical uh, and geoeconomic project in uh, the near abroad in this strategic sphere of influence, he uh, has sought also to uh, improve the positioning of Russia for the long uh, game. And I argue that we, uh, basically the war um, that was launched on the 24th uh, is the manifestation of the beginning of the Cold War uh, 2.0, a conflict between two systems, one obviously being an open system and the other one being a closed one. And it is evolving around uh, several important trends. First and foremost, uh, we talk a lot about uh, multipolarity, but in reality it's going uh, towards, uh, or it's developing towards a bifurcation of the system, meaning splitting of the system in two parts, in two uh, different, very different systems. Uh, we also uh, heard about the various comprehensive socioeconomic transformations. So if you look at all these globalized networks right now that can basically encompass the global system, you will uh, find out uh, that all relevant uh, systems, global finance, economy, uh, monetary, um, energy, and so on, are undergoing transformational processes. Processes. And of course, countries like China and Russia do not see benefits for themselves. So they try on the one hand to undermine uh, these networks, but on the other side also to create alternative networks. So uh, ongoing systemic competition between the United States and China is another important trend that has been actually um, uh, well, has been taking place uh, already during Obama's administration uh, and then con is currently also continuing under Biden. Then, of course, what we are going to witness is increasing tensions between the two Asian giants, uh, China and India, with the Indo-Pacific being the epicenter of the global power um, uh, competition in the near future. This, of course, will have repercussions for the old continent. On the one hand, we are already observing American withdrawal from uh, from the Middle East, uh, which is now more or less called uh, West uh, Asia. And on the other side, uh, in the long run, what we as European Union powers and institutions will also have to consider a possibility of an American withdrawal and what kind of political and geopolitical vacuum this could create because of the shift towards the Indo-Pacific. And finally, um, what we are currently observing is a kind of a... Uh, environment of fluid geopolitical formations and constellations between all relevant regional powers. Um, why? Because they don't want to get caught in a binary world. They don't want to take choices between two systemic rivals. Of course, most of the like-minded uh, transatlantic partners are uh, siding with the United States. But there is already a kind of a cleavage that is emerging uh, between, or let's say among them, when it comes to the Anglosphere way of approaching and dealing with the dragon bear with China and Russia, and then of course the continental powers here in the European Union, where we still of course pursue uh, an approach where we want to engage with China when it comes to business. So this kind of cleavage may also uh, continue growing and deepening, uh, depending on the way how the European Union and the European Union members will uh, basically uh, well further develop their approach uh, to China specifically now following uh, Russia, you know, Russia's war uh, against Ukraine. So I would stop here. Uh, we have a lot to do uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, the um, global order, in terms of our positioning in the global order. We also um, have to realize that it's not just Ukraine's war against, uh, it's not just that Ukraine is right now fighting against uh, Russia. We also have to make sure that Ukraine does not lose in this war. And that means we have to provide all required assistance in the long run because uh, there will be direct repercussions for the European security architecture 
um, following this war. And I argue, and this is a final remark on my side, uh, that this time, contrary to 2014, there will be no uh, coming back to uh, business uh, as usual. So we have to be prepared also for what kind of security order we want to establish together, um, despite the new security environment on the old continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valina. Uh, very stimulating thoughts, as always. I have to say what I always uh, very much appreciate is that you always keep this bigger uh, global story in mind. I mean, and I think as we're discussing this question of European integration and, and, and Russia and the EU, we always have to keep this US-China competition in mind because, of course, it influences, it influences everything. Guntram, turning to you now. I mean, we're living, we've established in a momentous time <coughs> geopolitically, but also geoeconomically. Mm. And we seem to be living through a rapid, drastic decoupling of, of Russia and the West. One can argue it started in 2014, but it's, it's much, much more different now. What does that mean for the EU uh, economy, would you say? And within that, I think what probably everybody's interested in, and we've heard a lot about it already, is, is the, energy, uh, and the energy element of that. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I do want to make five quick points. The first one is I really want to uh, congratulate you and the entire institute, the president, Michael Landesmann, the scientific director, the executive director for really um, 50 years. And uh, you have really established the WIIW as, I would say, one of the three leading international economic think tanks in, in Europe. And so it's really a great pleasure to be here. And I always enjoyed collaborating with you a lot. Um, so, so this was the quick point. The second point is um, on, uh, I, I did want to come back to the, I thought, very inspiring and good speech by Minister Gweslam, uh, where I think she made very clear that this is a, an absolutely historic situation where uh, Europe has to cooperate and where cooperation um, is to our benefit and where um, we cannot accept to be blackmailed by Russia in this situation. I think this needs to be very clear. I mean, if we accept the blackmail, Russia has already half won. And in the face of the atrocities of Butcher, I don't think this is acceptable. So so really, this, this means we have to pull together. And it means, um, uh, and there comes the third point, that on the energy side, um, there will be difficult moments, and there can be uh, very difficult moments in the in in the fall and in the winter of this year in particular. And so, so let me just say a few words on sort of the energy and the sanction uh, discussion more broadly. Mm -hmm. So this is my, my my third point. So so on the energy and sanction uh, sanction. Uh, a discussion. I mean, I think the EU and the Western powers, the international community has come forward with very significant uh, and very far-reaching sanction regime um, towards Russia that had a strong effect on Russia, um, on the Russian economy's medium-term uh, uh, growth prospects, um, technology sanctions in particular are very effective, but also the central bank uh, freezing of central bank assets is a very effective um, a pressure point on Russia. However, as long as we continue to import $1 billion worth of uh, fossil fuels per day from Russia, um, the uh, sanction uh, regime is not impressive enough to really um, have uh, a meaningful impact um, on the ability of Russia to actually continue with this war. Let me remind you that 40% of the Russian federal budget is funded by um, oil and gas revenues. Um, these revenues have gone up, not down, since the beginning of the war. And they have gone up because prices have gone up and quantities have not gone down, or not sufficiently gone, or very little gone down. So, so we are really de facto um, uh, have a sanction regime that has a lot of good things, but the one thing that really would, would hurt Russia um, is, is so far not fully addressed. Now, there is a discussion on this, and basically the embargo discussion has been ongoing now for, for many, many months. Um, and um, uh, the agreement uh, that seems to be, 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 have been reached at the European Council is, is essentially to stop um, uh, large parts of oil imports uh, more or less as of next year. Now, the problem with a, such an announcement of a, of a sanction um, in six months down the road, and the discussion is, 
well, you drive up prices now, right? I mean, so, so, so everybody knows that the biggest global supplier of gas and second, second biggest uh, exporter of oil in the world um, will probably export much less as of next year. Well, that has implications for energy markets now. And that means as long as Russia now continues to export, prices are up and the quantities continue to where they are, so meaning uh, Russia makes actually currently almost more profits than, than it used to without the prospect of, of a full embargo. So I think we have, a, we have an issue here, and um, that is why I think uh, you see here Daniel Gross from SEPS. Daniel, you have made this proposal. We have also made a proposal together with Ricardo Hausmann uh, from Harvard and others at a little piece in science basically arguing that you know, we need to go for a different approach, and that approach involves a tariff um, on uh, Russian oil and gas. A tariff would immediately uh, reduce Russia's profits, while at the same time uh, probably even pacify global energy markets and c calm them down because um, it would create a certain a certainty about the continued supply of Russian fossil fuels in the future. Comes my, my, my fourth point. Um, which is really uh, about about Ukraine uh, itself. I think it's it's extremely important that um, uh, we don't just sanction Russia, but we uh, actually support Ukraine. Um, I would put it st more strongly uh, uh, than uh, than you, Avelina. I think Ukraine should win the war. Uh, should not just not lose it. It should win the war. Um, and you know that means, of course, Ukraine needs uh, weapon weapons. Um, uh, and you know this, I guess, in my future job, I will will talk about it at the German Council of, on Foreign Relations. In my current job, um, what I what I do mention is uh, there's also an important financial dimension. So so. Ukraine has a lack um, of financial resources at the moment. Um, it needs um, international support. The estimates are three to five billion per month. Um, I think this this kind of support should be given, and it's very important that it that it is given now. This is really crucial. Now, medium term, and that comes to the accession discussion. Medium term, I, I do think it's extremely important that uh, we offer Ukraine now a realistic uh, perspective to be part of the European family. Because Ukraine has made a clear decision and has no choice after this, uh, after this aggression, but a choice to orient itself towards the West. And so I really would hope that um, uh, this, we analyze this question not just from the perspective of, of um, sort of um, the complications of membership and the difficulties of joining and the malfunctioning parts of the European Union and the Western Balkans. And there are so many reasons not to, not to give Ukraine a perspective. But I think in this historical situation, we have to give a political message here. And that political message needs to be very clear. You are part of the European family. We start um, the accession process. And how we then reform in the coming years the EU, I think this can wait, this discussion. This is not the primary message. It seems to me now has to be one of give Ukraine a, a positive perspective. And my very last point, I think, of course, there is a big question, what does it all mean for European integration? And uh, I have to say the one thing that keeps me uh, uh, currently uh, worried is that um, the EU um, isn't yet stepping up um, on the on the defense side, um, and um, you know the message the message um, that uh, Finland and Sweden join NATO is also um, uh, a message that the same security guarantee Article 40, I think 42.7, that is very similar to Article 5 of the NATO treaties, has much much less credibility than the than the NATO uh, than the NATO clause, and it seems to me that we have to have a discussion on. Uh, you know, what is going to, going to be next in European integration on the defense side? Um, and can we think of this next step on the defense side as a quid pro quo or a, a counterpart 
to the kind of fiscal integration that, of course, we are already undertaking now with next generation EU. So, so I think this is, uh, it seems to me, should be the de big debate. And the, the fact that Denmark yesterday in a referendum decided to actually end the opt out from, uh, from defense um, uh, in the EU treaties is, is a signal that there is a need here to do something. And so I would think this is one of the biggest debates we should have um, on the EU level on, uh, on integration going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we will come back to quite a few of the points that you've raised, uh, including, I think, enlargement, which, uh, which I know is of interest to many people here. I would like to stay just for the moment uh, with, with energy and moving to, to Birgit now. I mean, you, I know at the UNB are doing a lot of work on this. Of course, it's a very important uh, question for Austria, one of the countries, you know, with Germany and some other Central European countries with a particular reliance on, on, on Russian gas. I mean, how do you assess the impact so far of, of this? How do you assess the policy response? And what do you think the next steps are and should be? Thank you, Richard. Um, the energy question and coming to the region, which is covered by your institute, um, has several dimensions. And you always have to specify what to talk about. One thing which hasn't been covered and mentioned until now is that also there are nuclear plants of Russian style being run in the region, which also creates a sort of channel of dependency. Um, now, talking about oil, I think we, we nearly have the oil embargo um, with a little bit of last minute stumbling blocks like um, putting people off the sanction list. Um, but let's, let's say we have it. And, and coming from the Austrian perspective and then going to the region for Austria, it's a manageable um, challenge because we did not import a lot of oil from Russia, but I would like to draw the attention to indirect exports, where we get a lot of indirect exports, for instance, for, from Germany, which contains Russian oil. So we do have to clarify this within Europe, and it's also important for Eastern Europe, the CZ countries, as we call them in the UNB, um, that the re-exporting um, business is, is, is also challenged and has to be managed in a way that nobody stays without oil after the, after the cut. Um, in our countries in the region, and we here at the UNB do the forecasting for the so-called six CZ countries, um, I would like to send the message that the picture is not very bleak, because actually uh, the dependence here is very often overstated. So we have um, done the, the number checking. Um, and you also have to take into account direct imports from Russia of oil, indirect imports, and then also that some countries continue exporting or have a huge export share. And if you take all this into account and you put it into relation to the total domestic energy consumption, these CZ6 countries are not among the most top three dependent countries among EU member states. So they do follow then on some places. So three out of the CZ countries are among the nine top dependent countries. By the way, Austria, number seven. But it is something which is manageable. And I'm very glad that we have had this political, political agreement or nearly had it. Talking about gas, of course, this is a different league, and I would like to compliment um, the minister with um, our in-house expertise. Um, we have estimated um, the impact of a cut of gas for Austria with minus 3.1%, which you have to sub subtract from your GDP forecast. This is also more or less a non-cooperation scenario. Um, and it is, of course, something which we really have to prepare for. We all know the infrastructure issues and all this. I would say that we have to do um, two things. The one is that we have to still price in the possibility that Mr. Putin turns off the gas tap and we have to prepare our companies and really have to drill down in concrete plans because in Austria, the scenario is more or less that gas will go on flowing to households not to have a cold winter, but what about the industry? So this is for Austria really a game changer and it's nothing which can be taken easy in this country. And many of our neighboring countries are more or less in the same situation, talking about Slovakia. So it's something, and, and the minister did not specify the date today, but having been to this meeting and having read the plans, we, 
they talk, it's the Austrian Energy Agency, about an exit until 2027 from Russian gas. That's medium term. That's not immediate what we can manage here. And I'm talking about Austrian numbers because they also can run in parallel to what is, for instance, holds true for, for Slovakia and other countries. So this is something I would approach um, with care. I do like the ideas of applying economic instruments, like import duties are a much smarter instrument. And overall, uh, the exit has to be done on the basis of European solidarity. The devil, the devil lies in the detail. So you really have to make sure that things like re-exports don't stop. Um, that we know So Austria has a famous gas storage facility holding gas for, for Germany. And th those things also have to be checked clearly. And then we have to do a smart engineering of our gas exit including phenomena like yeah, taking an import duty, but also seeing that the prices don't rise through the roof anymore and make Russian household richer than ever again. Thank you. I'm sure there will be some audience engagement on, on that question. Before we go to the, to the first round of questions, I wanted to just put it back to Professor Hubner first. You've heard people respond now to, to your keynote. Um, I would like to give you the chance to, to respond to them. Um, but what would interest me especially would be the question of enlargement, which, which Guntram raised. I mean, we, we talked mostly about Ukraine, but a topic which I, I know is close to your heart and is very close to our heart at VV is the Western Balkans. And if we talk about EU integration, the Western Balkans is, is central to that. Can we be more hopeful on enlargement now as a result of this, this crisis? I think that it would be a big mistake, and now we, we, we continue this policy of postponing the, the enlargement in, in, in general. And then uh, we have to make it clear that there is no, um, I don't know how to even call it, not to offend anybody, but uh, the, the continuation of the process, meaning putting the Ukraine on the path of toward enlargement, I'm not saying more. I mean, this is the first step that we need. And parallelly, just take seriously the challenges in Western Balkans. Why can't we do it like this? I mean, <clears throat> we can see how miraculously we are getting a lot of funding for very different things in the short term. And I think that supporting the, the and making also Europe attractive from the point of view of supporting the changes needed in the Western Balkans also with European funding. This is something which we openly have to say. I, I remember how much we got before the accession and then after the accession for adjustment. So we, that was always the case of, of uh, Ukraine, that I think we, uh, we want to do it in the way that is not uh, seen by the candidate countries as, as really sufficiently supported process that could accelerate it. And then you have the, like we have in Western Balkans, China entering with, with very specific uh, supportive instruments which are just uh, competing with anything that we can offer. So, so I think that we t should take seriously uh, enlargement now because the future, uh, the post-war future will be the, maybe not as Joe Biden is saying, just autocracies against democracies, but around that I think so we, we, we just have to care about the democracy space that we are creating through, through enlargement and not, and, and there would be a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, potential also grabs of the member states by, by the, the autocratic regimes. Russia will want to be stronger. They, they all want to be the junior partner of China. They will have also to, to make themselves more powerful and there is a lot of land around that politically can be um, exploited as well. So I, I, I really think that Ukraine is not waiting for enlargement tomorrow. Ukraine knows very well and because they have the accession, the association agreement and they are really have done a lot. I was following it closely over the last years. I think they are better prepared today, if not the war hmm, and the destruction, than many of the member states that joined in 2004 and some at least of the member states. So I, I don't think there is the problem of being ready. There is the fear of many other factors, including political factors. And then, so, so I, I, I think there's no reason, and it is what will benefit, as I was trying to say, benefit uh, globally the position of, of, of Europe. And, um, and we will not lose millions of people as potential democratic citizens of European Union. Okay, so I would like to open it to the floor now, uh, leave plenty of time for questions. I imagine there will be a lot of engagement, so uh, 
Yes, I would take. I think we take a round of questions and then we can put it put it to the panelists. So, I can see one hand already uh, at the back, and we have one here, and one here at the front. So we we'll take these three as the as the first round. Yeah, um, maybe that my fantasy is not far developed. Louder, please. Can you turn the mic? Louder. We cannot hear you. No, no. But just speak in front like this. Speaking it's on, he says it is on. <laughs> just in front of the microphone. This yeah. uh, well, not to, I think uh, my fantasy is not far enough developed, but I cannot simply imagine that all these uh, issues raised and proposals raised by Madame Hübner and mm -hmm. also by Guntram Wolf could be realized without a revision of the treaties in the European Union. Uh, if this is not, will not be possible, I think nothing will change. And there we will not have a Zeitenwende or a turnaround in the European Union. Okay, one, okay. one here, Andreas, please. Yeah, Andreas, then, Andreas. Uh, first, also <laughs> congrats to the VEV. I'm from uh, Raiffeisen Bank International. You're a very useful source uh, for analysis and info. Uh, now my question, uh, as The Economist said, uh, that uh, market-based uh, sanctions would make more sense. Uh, I, I would be interested why is this not in, why didn't make it in, uh, this mm. into the sanction package? Uh, what's your explanation uh, that uh, such a tariff on Russian oil didn't make it there? So what are uh, the difficulties to convince here the politicians? Mm. Uh, and also looking into the future of Ukraine, what would you see needed for also private sector investment in a post-war Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. And then third question is for Daniela. And then there will be another round, don't worry. We, we, we should have time for a second round. Thank you. Um, I would like you to invite to unpack a bit this optimism of the Zeitenwende. Uh, and can you say a bit more about how exactly are we going to uh, achieve this very ambitious decarbonization targets by 2030? I heard uh, renewable electricity here in Austria. How are we going to achieve? Uh, is Repower Europe really the instrument that is going to power such a profound and rapid transformation? And if not, uh, what else is there? Thank you also for these very uh, succinct questions, which we appreciate. So I think we have in, in total four questions there. We have a treaty revision, the use of tariffs and the sanctions, the reconstruction of Ukraine, and the decarbonization targets. So I would maybe start again with Valina. You can jump in on yeah, whichever. I will only respond uh, to, do, uh, to those questions that, uh, well, um, consider my expertise. When it comes to the treaties revision, uh, specifically in the field of uh, security and defense uh, policy, there will be certainly, uh, certainly talks uh, uh, and discussions uh, following uh, the war on Ukraine uh, as to how to um, facilitate and uh, also speed up the process of uh, common security and defense policy. I would like to remind you that um, uh, in March, uh, our strategic uh, compass, uh, which was actually facilitated by all member states, and uh, was adopted by the member states, um, uh, has been launched. And this is basically our new strategic document, which not only serves as a new global strategy for the European Union, but also provides a platform for various actions and measures uh, in uh, um, many important fields. So this uh, transitionary period will uh, very much consider not just uh, rise, the rise, the search of defense budgets, but also the pooling of uh, capabilities, uh, the improving of uh, defense capabilities uh, between the member states uh, and also how to synergize better and more efficiently in the future. Uh, so here, when it comes to treaties, um, the treaties, probably one important discussion will be about the qualified majority when it comes to future participation of member states, uh, let's say, in, uh, um, in specific um, broader operations. Uh, and as you all know, um, there is this peak ambition of the Commission to be a geopolitical, to become a geopolitical actor. For the European Union to become a geopolitical actor, it, mean, it means only one thing, and that is 
hard power projection. Um, and here, once again, there will be a very tough discussion between the member states as to what exactly uh, they understand under hard power, uh, hard power projection, in which kind of uh, uh, environments, uh, is it the direct uh, neighborhood, is it Africa, is it the Middle East, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, operations uh, there will be in the future. But obviously, uh, being a geoeconomic uh, giant on par with China and uh, United States is not enough in this world. And uh, we will be further shrinking and will be further squeezed by other uh, global and regional comp uh, competitors and rivals um, uh, in the struggle for power if we do not at least be able to, um, well, to uh, defend um, our own uh, European interests, uh, our infrastructure investments, our uh, companies that operate uh, in other parts of the world. Um, when it uh, comes to Ukraine, um, I just want to add something for specifically for businesses, uh, I mean, have, covering um, the Eastern Partnership uh, since the launch of the initiative, which was the most relevant and important instrument of uh, the European Union towards Eastern Europe, not just Ukraine, uh, which also enabled uh, Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia then later to sign association agreements and deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Um, there will be certainly opportunities for uh, Ukraine, specifically for businesses and for private sector, because a lot has been already achieved in the last uh, more than 10 years in uh, this specific sector. A lot of platforms have been launched. There is a multilateral platform next to the uh, bilateral platforms uh, for Ukraine, where uh, private sector will certainly have a lot of opportunities uh, for uh, the reconstruction. But I will go back to uh, Guntram's remark and then I will give the floor, of course, to my uh, other distinguished um, colleagues. Uh, what uh, you said about uh, Ukraine, uh, I mean, Ukraine will win this war if it does not lose against Russia, while Russia will lose the war if it does not win against Ukraine. Okay, uh, Guntram. Any or any or all of the questions that you? Yeah, I mean, to. very quickly. I, I think the point on the tariffs and why wasn't it used? I think there is um, there's two uh, misconceptions. I think in the political system, one is that uh, one imagines that a tariff directly increases one to one the price for European consumers, which I think is an economic misconception. And given the demand and supply side elasticities, <clears throat> the incidence of the tax will be to a significant extent be borne by, by Russia, so Russia will essentially pay. Um, and the second is, I think, a, a misconceived um, idea that a delayed embargo uh, would allow, um, reduce um, the effects um, of, um, of the sanction um, on European companies and consumers. And of course, unfortunately, the announcement of the embargo already now increases the price and thereby increases the negative terms of trade shock for, for Europe. So, so in other words, we pay more for Russia. Russia makes more money, we pay more, uh, and that reduces, uh, is of course a strong driver also of the current inflation rates, right? So, so in that sense, I think uh, on, both, on both fronts, I think the political analysis has, has not been sharp and clear enough. So that, that's my take, why the tariff option wasn't wasn't taken, but uh, of course I, I would love to hear from from politicians and from others why why they didn't do this. Um, I mean, very quickly on um, on the decarbonization, uh, Daniela, um, uh, and how how do we achieve this? I mean, I, I do think this is uh, this is of course key, and the effectiveness of any sanction regime uh, on fossil fuel producers like Russia. Is, is only going is, is depending crucially on the speed with which we decarbonize because if we I mean if we don't decarbonize relatively quickly Russia will be able in a few years to just sell the stuff somewhere else and we we buy the stuff from somewhere else and so then it's just a sort of a tour de table where we sort of move around a bit the supply lines but the sanctions ultimately are ineffective so so getting out is really crucial because Europe is one of the biggest net uh, importers of fossil fuels. Um, and I think as the Minister Gewessler was saying, some of the renewable the renewables have become price competitive. They are actually now, if you look at unsubsidized 
wind and uh, wind and, and and solar compared to unsubsidized gas and coal it is already cheaper it is already cheaper because in the last 10 years these prices have come down by 90% or something of that sort. So, so there is a huge shift here in the production cost of, um, of renewables. However, it requires lots of investments to get there. And um, these investments um, are estimated uh, to be in the order of magnitude of 2% or so of GDP over the next decades, yeah? every year, 2% every year. So these are huge investments. and. Um, um, they need to be funded, um, and they, they are investments also in infrastructure, in uh, grid systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so this is a huge challenge, right? And I don't think we can underestimate that at all. I mean, this is um, this is going to be. I mean, even uh, outside of the war discussion, I mean, this is the, the transformation that we are undergoing because of climate change, and it will be hugely transformative um, uh, for us, and it will take a lot of time. And very last quick point on the treaty. Um, on the treaty revisions, I mean, uh, I think all the, the points I discussed were basically without treaty. The, I think the one sort of last point, which was a bit the, the, the visionary question, is what kind of European defense mechanisms do we develop in, on top of what officially exists? I mean, we have the mutual defense clause also in the EU treaties, which is very comparable to the NATO Article 5. Huh? So, so, so if that, that can be further strengthened, perhaps by just beefing up national defense capabilities. I mean, Germany's 100 billion uh, investment into, into, into defense uh, capa capabilities is, of course, also increasing European security, right? Um, but, uh, but of course, I think at some stage there is a question, um, should it be all only national or is there national and then mutual defense or do we need to think of something going beyond? And if we think of something going beyond, that I think would be really useful in a case where the US um, isn't fully um, a partner anymore because of its domestic politics. Um, you know, then I think you, you are in the, you're entering the territory where you need to talk about treaty changes, right? And so, so but you know, how this exactly would like and what it would imply, I, I mean, I, I haven't written on this and I think it would be just a fascinating area for more work. Let me stop here, thank you. As you finish with treaty changes, I will go next to Professor Hubner. I think we'd all be exactly. I think we'd be very, very interested to hear your thoughts. I mean, is it yeah, realistic? Uh, yeah. Is it necessary? Mm -hmm. I think we we all know that we have heard for decades probably our national politicians saying that citizens do not want the treaty change. I don't know if you remember it, but it was without argumenting. But now, as we have this pretext, a kind of provocation also coming from citizens who. Uh, who participated, and uh, these are their recommendations, and the council was very just sort of uh, convinced that it must be what we get will be not just something from parliament, something from other uh, obsessed with treaty change institutions, but it must be from citizens, and citizens asked for treaty change because they made in, in this list of 175 recommendations, there are at least 10 which require treaty change. And uh, there was a very clear commitment coming from European institutions, at least from the European uh, Parliament and the Commission would follow if the Council and the Parliament would agree. And we have the discussion next week with the Commission and in the plenary with the Commission and with the Council on, on the treaty change. The Parliament has already tabled one resolution. We are working, we already have the list of issues that should be discussed, um, should be used as a kind of first step to, to uh, convene the Convention in line with Article 48, uh, which is European Council should do it. So we are insisting and getting ready because we have those recommendations and there is the momentum and uh, there is this list and of, of the defense of course there is joint procurement for example which people say would re experts say would require um, a treaty change there is also a lot of is some issues related to energy autonomy to the energy union some additional um, uh, aspects also the co-decision on the multi-annual financial uh, framework where you have uh, unanimity in the in the council but there are also ideas of of, uh, moving to shared competences on education and on health policy, for example, as an outcome of the, what was happening 
recently, and there are also in CFSP some aspects of the emergency action also require treaty change. So there is, I think, justification to move towards treaty change, uh, but we, we, through convention, because we have this system coming from the Conference on the Future of Europe where everybody was together, we can use it, sort of prolong it, um, and have it also with, uh, in, in the format of the convention. So I, I, I think that we, there is this kind of momentum, but we will see whether, uh, because it's all in the hands of the Council right now, and the European Council in particular, so we will see what Mr. Orban would do, for example. Um, uh, but he might also hope for a treaty change that would <coughs> sort of uh, reduce the union to half of what it is or something like that. I don't know. But there are also uh, ideas that this treaty change could be used also to finally bring the change to, which was in the convention to the way we, um, uh, we uh, formulate, we establish, we decide on the, on the treaties and this idea of having this kind of constitution, but just 20 pages with all the values and clear commitments to the foundation of the European Union, and then those operational treaties, which would not require this uh, complicated unanimity-based and national, um, uh, national ratifications uh, procedure. So the topic is now discussed, but which way we will go, I have no idea. I would like to, to say a few words on, on the Ukraine reconstruction. There are already studies and assessment on, on how much we will need to, uh, to bring uh, Ukraine back probably not to back what we had, but to something which would be upgraded. Um, and it's absolutely clear that it's not about public money. Uh, there will be public money. There, is, there are donors. They meet from time to time, as you know, and, uh, but for the time being, for current functioning of, of Ukraine's administration, which is doing quite well, uh, considering. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know the, the figures, but what is already from all the meetings, I happen to participate also with business community, uh, without uh, security guarantee, it's out of question. So we will have to, what President Zelensky is calling for all the time, just think of a kind of uh, a treaty or whatever, not like Budapest, but something that would give also the, these guarantees that would just encourage the private investment uh, in, into the, the, the economy. But I, I think there are already people who work on it, just getting ready, identifying the needs and also privately. And so I think it will be a, a, an important um, uh, element. Thank you. Sorry, just the last thing on the accession. Association agreement, if you look into it, it was revised last year. It's 1,200 pages. Basically, it's like treaty structures. It's everything is there from very political, all aspects of political cooperation to the entire single market. It's basically enlargement policy uh, exactly. and enlargement uh, exactly. without participation in the institution. And very um, deep trade. Very technical, yeah. highly complicated, derived from the enlargement uh, so we just policy have to, process. To, yeah. So it's, it's see that it's implemented. And we are basically with one, one step, one leg and a half in. It's not the same, no? Absolutely. Uh, but no, but no, just I, to I say, agree, agree. association is not the same as a perspective to be really. Absolutely. Um, yes. no, so I, need, so, I agree with they, you that perspective is needed. But, but in terms of preparedness, <laughs> there is also the next level of. I think okay, now great. you have the exchange on the panel you wanted, right? <laughs> no, I just wanted to come back to the question on decarbonization and say I, I absolutely think it's the right plan at the right time. And I do agree with Guntram that it's a catalytic moment. Those things go hand in hand, energy security and climate change mitigation. We do see, of course, short-term trade-offs. Um, and let me just um, point out two things which I find remarkable. The one thing is, I mean, that out of a panic and out of this short-term need to cover energy consumption, now we create a new generation of energy assets, which may be the stranded assets down the road. Yeah? So I really wonder myself what will happen to the LNG terminals. I, I really admire German capacity of the government to go ahead and substitute um, Russian gas, but will they really throw away these LNG terminals in five years? And the other thing which I miss in the discussion, and also today is, and it's, by the way, it's part of um, Repower EU, is energy saving. 
And this is a more a society question, because why why don't we talk about it? Is it something which we have been become too spoiled that nobody really demands this, and politicians are too cautious? Um, and because we have a 50th anniversary, and because I'm one year older than the institute, I can also go back to the 70s and say maybe Austrians remember that we all had those little stickers on the car, and on one car it said Monday, Tuesday, etc., and then one day in the week you were not allowed to use your car. It's low-tech to implement, it's easy to monitor, yeah? and I don't see those proposals in the discussion, not even in theory. I also think that, uh, that the, the Commission has thought about it. We, we didn't have in any public discussions like in the Parliament or, or in the Council. I don't think that those instruments have been considered. Some member states have uh, certainly locally discussed them, but I don't think so. But I'm absolutely convinced that the Commission, when preparing Repower EU, they looked into all the potential that is already there to, to, to grab and to use, which is what you mentioned also, everything that we can do on efficiency and on reducing the, uh, the needs. That they looked also into the uh, potential, for example, unused, which is uh, in the uh, RRF and the recovery and resilience um, uh, funds. Uh, we didn't use the, member states didn't use the, the loan part of it. Only seven member states reached out to the loans, and there is a huge amount of funding that uh, is not used. So I think that the Commission is also looking at all other instruments that can be first fully used before we, 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 we maybe made the next step, which, which I, I hope that they are thinking of it. I can't believe that they are not thinking of it. So I, I, I trust that one day we will see it on the table. But I think the logic might be that there is still such a huge space to, to be used before we, uh, we prepare the, the good uh, um, economic uh, related to the uh, tariffs and all sorts of additional uh, maybe fees, I don't know, uh, concept. I, that's my feeling. Okay, we have about, we have a very tight stop. We have about 12 or 13 minutes left. Our panel have to catch taxis and trains and things. One final round of questions. Uh, this, on the first, because you had your hand up in the previous round, so you go first, if Andreas can f find you. Uh, Michael? And lady in the middle here. And I think that is all we'll have time for. And, and keep questions short, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I will try to keep it yeah. as short as possible. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Association of Austrian Paper Industries, and um, I'm very glad to see foreign policy experts and econ economic experts talking to each other on policy here on this panel and basing their discussion on the very sound research of WIW, because this is really what we need. My question pertains to natural gas. I think when you talk about economic assessments of how much percentage of GDP you may lose in case of a gas embargo, uh, I would like to give some context because industry in Austria is about one third of natural gas consumption and it cannot replace natural gas in the short term, meaning one and a half to two years. We simply cannot replace it. And industry means that food production Dairy products are pasteurized using natural gas. If there is no natural gas, there is no pasteurization process. There is electrical power plants which, which provide on-demand electricity with natural gas. If we have no natural gas, we have blackouts. This is not just a percentage number of GDP. So I would like to hear from the panelists um, if they think that European solidarity how exactly it will help us in the case of a gas supply disruption. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, and then uh, lady in the middle. And no, uh, this is a question, a, a bridge to this afternoon's panel, <laughs> and also what uh, uh, Guntram already partly talked yesterday. How do you assess, probably to Danuta and uh, Guntram, uh, the sort of challenge in orders of magnitude to the EU budget? Uh, because there is climate change, there is the package, reconstruction package for, the e, uh, for Ukraine. There is probably uh, uh, quite a large package uh, for enlargement before enlargement, <laughs> because it has to be beefed up in order to make the waiting room a bit warmer here. Yeah? And there is, beyond the climate change challenge in Europe, there is this uh, 
need to support investments outside Europe, <laughs> which I think is a big pressure, I think, uh, articulated in Glasgow, but not very much responded to by uh, the richer world. So this, if you sum that all up, it amounts to almost like uh, three additional next EU uh, uh, programs, <laughs> which I think one of your uh, uh, members, Andre Sapir, managed uh, men mentioned that even for Ukraine, we should have a next uh, EU uh, package. Uh, how feasible is it, and how much is the discussion in the European Parliament uh, concretely uh, focusing on this question of an enormous increase of budgetary uh, needs? And then uh, here. My name is Olha Bosak. I am from Ukraine, and I'm currently based in Vienna. Uh, I used to work in energy sector, and I continue working in energy sector in Austria. Uh, being Ukrainian, I strongly believe that Ukraine will be an added value to the EU, and I'm very glad that many Europeans uh, share this understanding. Thank you. And my question goes to all speakers. Uh, how would you identify main risks of not taking Ukraine to the EU as EU member state? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice question to finish on, I think. So we have three questions. We have the question about gas and industry, the impact on industry specifically. We have a question about the budget. And we have a question about the risks of not taking Ukraine into the EU. So I think you have about two or three minutes each. Um, maybe we can start with Guntram this time. Okay, um, thank you. Great questions. I mean, on the gas question, I think, is, is crucial. Um, we need solidarity within the EU, and uh, this means um, there will have to be um, gas flows from the west to the east. I mean, if there's a complete disruption, there will have to be some gas flows from the west to the east, and if we don't have them, um, I think Gewessler, Minister Gewessler cited the, the numbers, then, I mean, you say it's not, not just the numbers, so I'm an economist, so then the GDP impact is bigger, right? So the number is bigger, much bigger. And it's bigger because there will be more uh, uh, shortages in critical industries. Um, now, um, again, I think we should be clear that even a full uh, immediate gas stop, I mean, uh, there will be reactions and there will be um, uh, a, a, a burden sharing um, also within countries. And of course, industries, I mean, I, I often get the example of, of the glass industry where, it, you know, if you stop having gas, then not only you stop producing, but the, the manufacturing capacity, I mean, the, the machines actually break down, right? Because okay, but these industry will continue to get the gas. Somebody else will have to be uh, to get less gas, right? And so, so that why, uh, that's why I think, uh, um, uh, Birgit, uh, your message on, on demand um, measures already now is actually very, very important. I do, I do think we need to really try to save now as much as possible um, uh, so that we, we can, uh, be, uh, can manage a possible fallout and be less um, susceptible, susceptible to, to the Russian uh, blackmail. On the EU budget, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you raise a great question. Um, it all will cost a lot of money. I have to say, when you, when you think about the, the reconstruction of Ukraine, which is, of course, a huge topic which we haven't talked about, um, of course, Europe will be a larger part of that um, discussion uh, and the, the financial needs. But I also think some of the numbers that are out there um, about how much it will cost, I mean, they are a little bit ballooned, right? I mean, so so I would say uh, the, the, the destruction of the capital stock, yes, it's there, um, uh, but yes, it's not 500 billion or the kind of numbers that are here, it's much less. Huh? So, so I think we need to be very careful on this. And of course, then when, you, when the money flows, were to flow, then the governance is key, right? And that's why uh, I think also there the, the accession process could be a nice way of anchoring, um, let's say, um, uh, the institutional development and making sure that the money goes in the right channels, right? And so, and so then the question on the, what if Ukraine is not an EU member? If, uh, I mean, this is a brilliant, brilliant question and um, congratulations on that question. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So I mean, I mean, my take, my take is on this. Um, I mean, there is a really big risk that we will get um, 
uh, I mean, not that, I mean, there's two risks, I would say. One is Europe loses a lot of uh, moral authority, I would say. Um, and the second risk is um, to Ukraine itself and what it means uh, means for Ukraine's future. And if Ukraine's future then becomes a muddled future with lots of dodgy deals and, um, you know, resurfacing of old uh, Eastern-oriented oligarch structures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. I mean, then, then we have a sort of very difficult state um, on the Eastern side. And so in that sense, I really think we need to give a perspective to Ukraine. Maybe Professor Hoopner next. Yes. Um, on budget, I, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but remember we have this regulation on new revenues, and uh, there is already plan, as I think the first sources will enter next year and then next year. The problem is that I think one of the first sources is supposed to be what is blocked by my home country in the council, which is the taxation of the international enterprises. And uh, so, so this, and then I think there is CBAM, which is not yet, uh, the, uh, and, and th then just others will, will come uh, on the plastic, I think is already functioning. So I think we, we, we put, I think, on the table the, the need uh, uh, that we need, will really need seriously the, the new sources, the new revenues, and uh, so that it just can facilitate, can adjust, I think, also the, uh, the whole program. That's, uh, that's what I would uh, see as, a, as an important element. Plus, the second thing is that, as you know, uh, the recovery and resilience fund is not used because of the of those seven states that reach out only for the loans. So there are hundreds of millions, I think, which can be still used. I don't know how it comes in tranches in terms of um, when it will come to the uh, to the budget. But uh, but there is also this. But in, in, I, I don't know if it's enough. Yeah. So, but but I must tell you that there is no really concern in the discussions. Like if it was not yet an issue. And I just trust that those who are responsible for long-term budget will, will take it into account. And on, the, on, on Ukraine, to, just to add, I share what, what uh, Guntram just said. But I also think that one of the major risks is that uh, we will leave the people of Ukraine um, disappointed. And right before the war, the last survey that I saw was, I think, slightly above 60 percent, which is... If you look at the member states and the European, it's quite big support, and that was still before the war. I can imagine that now it might be, uh, it might grow. Uh, and then what it means, I mean, what kind of political forces will use this to build political capital on this, and what kind of radical, um, not really democratic tendencies we can wake up in, in Ukraine, and that depend also, will depend also what, what will be the role of Mr. Putin and his acolytes, and what will be happening there, and how this long impact Will will will, uh, will look like so. So I think we, we should well orchestrate, well prepare, uh, really linking the Ukraine so strongly with the perspective very clear. When I talked about the 100,200 pages of the accession agreement, it was not to say or oh, everything is already done. It was to say that it's a small step to move from association. Uh, because that's what I, when I listen to proposals coming from France or or, um, or uh, other now. It, it just talking about association agreement, which we already have, and uh, it just they let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. So, <laughs> so, yeah. thank you. Okay, we are almost out of time. I would ask first Birgit and then Valina, maybe on one of the questions, some final thoughts. I propose one sentence on each. Oh, <laughs> no, on okay. each. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> fully agree with the representative of the paper industry. Our numbers should help your cause because we don't should jump into a gas embargo unprepared. We have to get our act together before we enter the political scene. Um, fiscal needs, huge, no comment on this, but also the, the private investment. And here from a central banker's view, the interesting thing is that for a long time we have been longing good purposes for investment. It may also be a game changer in terms of natural rate of interest, yeah, that now the search for yield is over and we really must put a lot of money into reconstruction of Ukraine, into a bipolar world where you have new assets distribution and climate change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, um, because everything was said in Ukraine, which I fully agree with, but because I also know that there are Russians in the audience, yeah, I would like to take up one point which was made already, but emphasize it once more. We need a clear post-war view on the cooperation with Russia. Russia 
I'm not talking about Mr. Putin. I'm, I'm talking about Russians. They must not become the pariah. Yeah? And we, they won't go away, those four, 145 million people. And uh, we have to think beyond the war, also in terms of Russia, not only in terms of Ukrainian investment. Well, then let's hope that uh, it's up to the Russian people to not uh, turn Russia into a pariah. Uh, but speaking about Ukraine, speaking about Ukraine, um, let me let let me remind you that uh, Ukraine was already once invaded in 2014, and it was not because it was striving for NATO membership. It was because it was striving for European Union membership. So what happened afterwards was that uh, Ukraine signed the association agreement, uh, which is why I, I, I actually count on the member states that this time Ukraine also finally gets the option for uh, the perspective for membership, because this would be the least that the European Union and members can offer Ukraine in terms of credibility and in terms of moral compass. And it's, uh, in fact, from my perspective, uh, I mean, enlargement is, in fact, the most successful and most ambitious geoeconomic project of the European Union, and Ukraine has deserved its place in it. And I would ask, also answer very shortly the question on gas. Um, well, I mean, Russia already indicated who is going to be, uh, who is going to be paying uh, for gas in rubles and who is not going to be paid. Because we have five countries that have been put already uh, on this embargo list. And there was also indication that the rest is fine. So I suppose that in the short term, uh, there will be also Austrian uh, among, uh, among, the other, uh, among the other accounts uh, at the uh, Gazprom Bank, which is why I do not uh, anticipate an embargo in the short term. But what is more important is what is happening afterwards, after the short term, uh, for gas supply. And here, once again, we often neglect uh, initiatives that have been already in place, like the TRISIS initiative, which has been, right from the beginning, an initiative between 12 member states, including Austria, even though that Austria is very inactive in it, where it was about diversification away from Russian supply. And one of the ways and one of the reasons why, for instance, uh, Poland and the Baltics were able to, uh, at least part of them, to, uh, to cope with an embargo, for instance, you know, Poland, is because they used TRISIS initiative to build uh, alternative um, LNG uh, terminals. So Austria can actually, being a member of this initiative, can actually also think of options to get uh, uh, LNG, for instance, from the north, but also from the south. Uh, uh, another option would be Croatia with uh, the island Krk. Uh, so that would be on my side, and I want to use also the opportunity uh, at the end to congratulate uh, the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, uh, the President Svoboda is here, uh, the whole team, management team and the whole team, and to um, wish you uh, for the next 50 years even more success, um, not only in Austria, where you have left a significant footprint uh, with your research, with your analysis and with your studies, but also uh, in Europe and internationally. Thank you very much. Thank you.